singing then, we're looking at this short section that we're moving on to in Leviticus chapter 24, on the golden lampstand, or the menorah, as the Hebrew word for it is. And this brings us to a wealth, actually, of biblical imagery, in which I think, well, as I was setting out to try and plan this sermon, I thought, well, there's, there's just so much material, actually. And my biggest problem, it felt like, was, was to not to overload you with stuff and confuse you. So I hope I won't do that this evening. I hope it's rich without being complicated and, uh, and overly so. Like the branches that shape this menorah lampstand, it has branches into numerous parts of the Bible, bringing out different points and illustrating different things. And so what I present tonight, I do not do so as, as something that is exhaustive. Um, but I hope it will be helpful and I hope it will be a true interpretation, um, a helpful and, and right interpretation, uh, though not necessarily the only one, as we'll see. Let's start here. Jesus said two things, and I want us to put them together. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Okay? I am the light of the world, says Jesus, and you, you plural, all of you, you, you my disciples, he's saying, are the light of the world. How do we put those two things together? How are we to understand that? And I think this menorah that we look at this thing, this lampstand, helps us to understand how those two things fit together. The lampstand helps because it represents both Christ and the church, as we'll see. It represents Christ and those grafted into him, born again into a new life in him. So Jesus is the true light that is already shining 1 John 2, verse 8. And we who are believers grafted into him by grace are to, sh are to shine like lights, it says in Philippians 2. We're to shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. That's Philippians 2, verse 15. And so the way the lampstand helps us is it being in the form of a tree. A tree with three branches on one side three branches on the other side, and a trunk holding it all together. And so we can think of John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I'm the branch, and you're the, sorry, I'm the vine, and you're the branches. So I see you smiling, correcting me, thank you. Do, do, do wave at me if ever I say things wrong, because I do sometimes, and I need to jump up and down, and I've been known to say heresy before now, uh, inadvertently, and have to go and edit it in YouTube. Anyway, enough of that. Here's a picture of the menorah, if you can put it up. Thank you, Akeem. There it is. This is from the ESV Study Bible, and it's based on the description in Exodus chapter 25, which uh, the people of Israel were to uh, make, and Bezalel in particular was responsible for making this, amongst other things that he had to make. Now, do you see how it has both branches and also blossoms? Okay, so it's got these little flowers, these little buds, these with, with their calyxes. It's a uh, Intricately described in Exodus 25. And almond blossom, it kept coming up in, in Exodus 25. Like an almond blossom, it said. Like an almond blossom, it kept coming up. And so the menorah, this lamp stand that stood in the tabernacle, uh, uh, and uh, later there were uh, menorahs in the, in the temple, it was meant to look like an, an almond tree blossoming in spring. That's what it's meant to look like. Okay? That's quite topical, isn't it? Here we are, springtime. Uh, clock's going forwards today. And uh, I don't know if you about you, but I love the season of spring. I think it's one of my favorite seasons, possibly. Um, uh, to see the, the uh, crocuses particularly coming up, I love that. And, and the daffodils as well. And uh, they're still in, in full bloom in many places, aren't they? And, uh, and soon the blossoms are going to appear on the trees. And uh, I, I we live near Willingdon Park Drive, and that's a great road for blossom trees in, in the springtime. Um, really beautiful road. Uh, this time, well, in a few weeks' time, it will be. But here's the sad thing. They don't last very long, do they? There's blossom trees on Willingdon Park Drive. I, in bygone years, there have been winds shortly after the blossoms have come out, and it's just blown everything away like confetti. And even though there's not a wind... A, a, a severe wind like that, then still they, they wither all too soon, don't they? But here's the thing. The menorah was a perpetually 
blossoming almond tree. Perpetually blossoming almond tree. That's what it's meant to depict. Perpetually shining its light. And a word that keeps coming up in this, this short section of Leviticus is the word continually. I, I, it's actually the word, it's translated as regularly in the ESV, but I think a little naughtily. I think continually is, is, is really more the sense of it. So it, it comes up in verse 3 and verse 4. Aaron shall arrange it uh, from evening to morning before the Lord continually. Verse 4, he shall arrange the lamps on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord continually. This was meant to be a continually shining, blossoming light tree. That's what it is. One commentator regarding the menorah says this, the continuous nature of the burning symbolizes God's everlasting giving of life and light to his people. Great. Well, let me show you how then the menorah points us to Christ and to the church. First of all, how it points to Christ. And this shouldn't be surprising if you um, are familiar with, uh, with some of the Bible passages to do with light, uh, the, like the famous one we read at Christmas, Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Who is this great light? It's the sun born. It's the child uh, born into the world. It's Jesus. And then John 8, Jesus stands and says, I'm the light of the world. So we shouldn't be surprised to see that the menorah uh, points us to Christ. Now, I don't know if it's ever occurred to you, but in various ways, the Bible draws a comparison between the tabernacle, this tent of the Lord, through which the Lord met his people, through the sacrifices and the priesthood and so on. There's, a, there's a, a parallel that the Bible draws between that and the Garden of Eden. Has that ever struck you? Have you ever noticed that? Or has that ever come to your attention? Adam walked with God, we're told, in the Garden of Eden. And if you look in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12, just over the page, you'll see there that the Lord says, And I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. The form of the word walk there, the, the, the verb and the, the form of it is the same as used of Adam walking in the garden with the Lord. Adam was to work and keep the garden, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the priest, similarly in Numbers 3, verses 7 and 8, the priest was similarly told to work and keep the garden, the same verbs used there. There was garden-like imagery in the tabernacle, and more so in the temple, the solid version that came later at the time of King Solomon. So we read, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 29, that the, that the inner walls of the temple were carved with date palms and flowers and cherubim, all reminding uh, or reminders of the Garden of Eden. And so if the tabernacle was a, a sort of reminder of Eden where God walked with his people, then various commentators have seen in the tree-like menorah an emblem of the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden for their sin and disobedience of him. And the rest of the Bible is the unfolding of God's great plan of redemption all fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Old Testament tabernacle on that uh, uh, part way on, on that journey from, from Genesis 3 and, and, the, and the disaster that happened there as, as mankind sinned and, and rebelled against God and was thrown out of the Garden of Eden this, this, we have this way mark on the way this tabernacle a signpost to God's plan of salvation foreshadowing the sacrificial work of Christ by which people may be readmitted into the holy presence of God. And so the tree of life in the Garden of Eden and depicted by this menorah, this branch-like lampstand, tree-like lampstand, uh, it, it points us to Christ. In Genesis 3, verse 22, we're told that whoever eats of the tree of life lives forever. And that points to the person trusting in Christ for salvation and receiving eternal life in him. So the Lord Jesus Christ then, then is the tree of eternal life held out to mankind um, who've been expelled from Eden, expelled from God's presence for our sin. But God has brought, uh, uh, holding out to us a tree of eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is fundamental and we're gonna, we need to get this really firmly in place as a foundation stone before we move on to thinking about the menorah as pointing to us. We need to get this foundation firmly in place first. 
Because when we come into talking about the church, the people of Christ, as being represented by the menorah, we're talking about those who've come to Christ for eternal life, who are feeding, if you like, on the tree of life, who are feeding on Christ by faith, who acknowledge that Jesus is the only means of redemption, the only means of going back into God's presence, the only means of being readmitted to paradise. Jesus is the only way. And so it's only people that have come to Christ in repentance and faith, freely confessing that all is not right between them and God that they have sinned and they've been part of the whole human race that sinned and the whole human race that's been thrown out of God's presence, thrown out of Eden, thrown out of paradise. And so we need to come to God humbly, repentantly, confessing that and trusting solely, feeding solely on the one tree of life that God has provided, the Lord Jesus. So Christ then is the one source of eternal salvation. Christ is the ever-blossoming tree of life. Jesus is the ever-burning lamp of eternal life. Jesus is the menorah. He's the one it points to. So let me just ask first, as we try and get this foundation stone firmly in place, has anyone here this evening not yet come to Christ humbly and repentantly on your knees, pleading with him for forgiveness like a desperate, starving man feeding from this tree of life, Jesus? Because that's how we need to come. And Jesus beckons us to come to him. He says, come, come freely. Come without paying anything. It's all paid for by me, says Jesus. But you need to come. You need to renounce all sense of self-worthiness. You need to come and renounce your sin and turn and desire and seek a new life in me, says Jesus. And so that's what we need to do. And so if you've not done that, that is the fundamental thing you need to do. And you need to listen to nothing else this evening. Apart from that, you need to listen to this, that you need to confess yourself a sinner rightly expelled from God's presence, as we all were rightly expelled from God's presence. And we need to come humbly, repenting of our sin and putting our trust in Christ. And if you've never done so, I urge you this evening to do that before you even leave this place, to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Let me then second tell you, tell those of you who've done so, that you are now in Christ, grafted into Christ, united into Christ, branches in Christ. Like we saw, like we heard just from that brief reference to John 15. He's the vine, you're a branch in him. And the union that you have with Christ is so beautifully represented by this menorah being of one hammered piece of gold. Bezalel, when he came to put this menorah together, didn't start off with sort of seven bits of gold that he soldered together. Somehow he starts off with one piece of gold, a very big piece of gold, 75 pounds it weighed, and he hammers that one piece of gold until where it's gone now, until it forms the shape of that amazing tree. And that tells us about the union between Christ and those who are his, the closeness, the organic Union, I can't put it any better than that, the organic, organic union between Christ and the church. You've been so grafted in that you're like one piece with Christ now. And so this lampstand with its seven lamps on its seven branches points as well as pointing to Christ, it also points to you in him because Christ now is, is never alone. The whole Christ is Christ and his bride united to him. And so you who believe in him in that way I've described in that repentant, humble way, trusting in him alone for your salvation from sin. You are in Christ now. And we see this most clearly, most clearly in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, maybe we'll just turn there quickly. Revelation chapter 1. Uh, it's on page 1028. Uh, uh, let me just read a few verses here. And... Uh, John has this vision on the Lord's Day on the island of Patmos while he's uh, exiled there for the sake of being a Christian. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, then I, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven 
golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash round his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining shining uh, in full strength. There's a huge amount of symbolism and Im- imagery there. And at the bottom of the chapter, verse 20, it explained to us who these seven lampstands are. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here we have seven lampstands. And if the fact that it's seven lampstands rather than one lampstand, well, we also have the sevenfold spirit of God mentioned uh, in Revelation. And it's referring to, to the one spirit of God uh, rather than seven separate Holy Spirits. And so I think we can take the language of this to refer to uh, a, a, a lampstand like the menorah uh, in, in seven, uh, seven parts that correspond to these seven different congregations around Asia Minor that John is writing to. So let's turn back from there. Let's, let's go to a staging post on the way. So we've thought about Christ, the tree of life, uh, the menorah like tree of life. We've thought about Christ, uh, uh, sorry, the, the menorah as uh, being fulfilled as well in the church grafted into Christ. Let's, there's a staging post on the way in Zechariah chapter 4. Let's just turn there. This is on page 795. Zechariah chapter 4. Now, this is not a particularly easy chapter, but it's, it's a very relevant chapter, so I'll read it, um, and I'll draw a few um, conclusions from it. I'll draw a few things from it, but I, I won't promise to give you uh, e- uh, the authoritative interpretation of it, um, as I think it may have more than one interpretation, but, but anyway, let me read, the, read it for you from verse 1. Uh, again, this is a vision. This is uh, Zechariah this time in the Old Testament seeing a vision. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who's awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is, what the word, th- this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. He's the sort of governor of God's people of Judah at this time. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the, s- the, stone, uh, the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the Lord, word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. That's the, the temple of the, uh, after the exile. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the, s- the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees that stand uh, on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. And then he said, These are the two anointed ones or the two sons of new oil who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. It's interesting that Zechariah gets told, don't you understand these things? And he said, no, my Lord. <laughs> well, I'm not sure where you understand. Well, I'm not sure I understand all these things either. But we can get some things, uh, fr- some things from this vision. The major point seems to be verse 6. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What's the strange, unique feature about this lampstand here? Well, it's got a couple, actually. It's got... It's actually got seven on uh, seven on the seven branches. It's got seven little uh, lips on each, and um, but it's also got these two pipes connecting it to two olive trees. Now, what does a lamp need to burn? Well, 
if you're in ancient Israel, the thing you need to burn is olive oil. That's what they would produce. That's what our passage, in fact, Leviticus talks about, the people providing olive oil for the lampstand. But this, this one has pipes. It's, 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 it's plumbed in this lampstand directly to two olive trees. And God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And that seems to be the point. The olive oil representing God's Holy Spirit. Now, historically, Zechariah 4 is at a time when God's people had little power. Sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? They had little political influence. They a bit like us today. They were few in number. It was a day of small things, it says there, for the people of God. And it's the same for us nowadays, isn't it? But Zechariah was given this vision to encourage them. And so the pipes feed this continual supply of oil. And that symbolizes the continual supply of the Holy Spirit for the beleaguered people of God. And thus they were to be encouraged, not by might, they had none, nor by power, they didn't have any of that, but by my spirit, says God. And so through Christ and the gospel, we have an inexhaustible supply of the Holy Spirit by which to shine forth Christ's light. We're grafted into Christ the lamp, the tree of life that shines out eternal life. We're grafted in by faith. And we have this continual supply if we've done so. If we've come to Christ, we have this continual supply of the Holy Spirit. And so this seems to be a le legitimate interpretation of the menorah, this golden lampstand for us. And it's this. God has shone his light into our hearts. And by the continual supply of the Holy Spirit through Christ, we are to shine forth his light faithfully in the darkness of the world in which we live. So Christ is the light. He's the great light which has dawned on the people walking in darkness, Isaiah 9. He's the sunrise visiting us from on high, it says at the end of Luke chapter 1. That great passage of Zechariah's prophecy that talks about the, the, the tender mercies of our God by which the sunrise has visited us from on high to give eternal life to those living outside of Eden in the shadow of death. That's Luke 1, 78, 79. And so Christ is the light who's come into this world in human flesh. He's shining in the darkness of our world, which the darkness has not overcome, even though the the, our world threw death at him, threw crucifixion at him. He's not succumbed. He's not uh, been destroyed. He's been resurrected. And his light still shines. The true light is shining. And individually, through new birth, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts, individually, those who love Christ, those who've had the Spirit poured into us by God's grace. God has shone his light into our hearts, just like he'd said in the beginning, let there be light. In everyone he saves, God says, let there be light in that person's heart, in that person's soul. And he's done so, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, it says, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. And so now, by God's Holy Spirit, we are to shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Philippians 2, verse 15. We're to do as Jesus says in Matthew 5. Turn with me to Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. It's on page 810. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Okay, so we've had Jesus, the light of the world. Here he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So our lives then, blessed by God with new birth, poured his, his Holy Spirit poured into us, those who trust in Christ. Our lives are now meant to, to burn the light of Christ outward, to shine the light of Christ outward, to display the, the light and life of Christ in the things we do, in the things we say, and the things even we think. 
Now, this is a challenge. You know, sometimes I come across a Bible passage and I think, ah, I've got to preach that on Sunday, but I'm, I'm a failure at that. Well, this is one of those passages. I certainly felt like it anyway. It's very easy to hide our Christian light under a bucket, isn't it? Under a bushel. It's very easy to do so, and I feel that maybe I've gone through a period recently of doing that to my shame. And so this, li- this passage challenges me, and maybe it challenges some of you too. We are not meant to be Christians wrapped up, sealed up, so that no one can tell that we're Christians. We're meant to shine. We're meant to have the light of Christ inwardly, and we're meant to shine it outwardly. Very little time. Let me just look at a couple more passages. There's a biblical theme of faithfulness and keeping going to the end that I want to see as I begin to sort of wrap up. So I've got a couple more passages. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 13 as the first of those two. 2 Chronicles 13. It's on page 367. I'll read verses 1 to 4 start with. Two Chronicles 13, verse 1. In the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, Abijah began to reign in over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. Now there was war between Abijah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, king of Israel. This is the point where God's kingdom has been divided in two. A bit of a disastrous period of time. So Abijah, that's the king king of Judah, went out to battle having an army of valiant men of war, 400,000 chosen men. And Jeroboam, king of Israel, drew up his line of battle against him with 800,000 chosen mighty warriors. Then Abijah stood up on Mount um, Zemariah, that is in the hill country of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, O Jeroboam, and all Israel. So do you see these two kings, king of um, Abijah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, king of Israel, about to go into battle, and Abijah is addressing the king of Judah. Let's pick it up at verse 8, verses 8 to 11. And now, says Abijah to Israel, and uh, the king of Israel, uh, Jeroboam, and now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, because you are a great multitude and have with you the golden calves that Jeroboam made, for y- uh, made you for gods? Have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made priests for yourselves like the people of other lands? Whoever comes for ordination with a young bull or seven rams becomes a priest of what are no gods. But as for us, says Abijah, king of, ki- king of Judah, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. We have priests ministering to the Lord who are sons of Aaron and Levites for their service. They offer to the Lord every morning and every evening burnt offerings and incense of sweet spices. They set out the showbread on the table of pure gold and they care for the golden lampstand that its lamps may burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Do you see here how King Abijah, who is a faithful king, is contrasting himself with the king of Israel, King Jeroboam, who'd made gods like golden calves uh, and told the people to worship them. And so Jeroboam was unfaithful to the Lord, making these golden idols and appointing whomever he wanted to be appoint to be priests. Abijah, though, was faithful to the Lord, and it's exemplified, amongst other things, by the fact that the priests in Jerusalem kept the golden lampstand burning. And so Abijah's army, though it's half the size of Jeroboam's, uh, prevails, and the Lord gives Abijah the victory, verse 15. But the point is this. Faithfulness, if I can put it like this, our faithfulness to God as his children entails keeping our menorah light of Christ shining. Just like they had to keep the light of the menorah shining all the time, perpetually, continually. So we have to keep the, 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 the light of Christ shining. And so if we would be faithful to the Lord then it's no good withdrawing to, um, to hiding our light. Well, like I was saying earlier, it's easy to do, isn't it? It's easy to sort of, you know, I'll just be a, I'll just be a Christian privately. 
easy to do that. We've got to pay attention to keeping the light of Christ shining inwardly and outwardly too. Openly in word and deed. Let me just read this little quotation. Andrew Bonar, who's, who's a commentator from a, a bygone century, writes this uh, regarding the p- passage of Leviticus that we've been looking at. There were golden snuffers for these lamps, and the use of them was committed to the priest who went in to set things in order. Believers must have their gifts and graces stirred up so that there be no dullness, no indecision, no languor. When you, feel, when you feel a little pride stealing in, or love of praise, or fondness for comfort, or earthly cares, go then, believer, to the priest, meaning to Christ. Let him dress the lamp for you. Let's look finally at a possible reference to um, the menorah in Luke 12. This is our last Bible passage that we'll go to, Luke chapter 12. I'll draw things together then. This is on page 871. Luke 12, I'm going to just read verses 35 to 37. And hopefully you'll hear pretty, in pretty instantly the, uh, the connection to our theme this evening. Luke, 20, uh, Luke 12, verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. Now there are some fantastic bit, bits in there. The, the bit I want to pick out is the, right the very start, verse 35. Keep your lamps burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning, says the old Negro spiritual song. Referring to this passage, I think, and also referring to the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. And both those two passages are about keeping, burning, and shining to the end so as to be ready for Christ's return. So we to think, uh, as we draw to a close, I want us to think about faithfulness. Okay, That's what Abijah was like. They, they kept the, the lamp burning continually. We're to keep our lamps burning. We're to keep the lamp of Christ burning and to be ready for Christ's return. So we have to make sure that the light of Christ, the, the, lamp, the lamp of Christ is burning inwardly in us. Attend with constant care, says the hymn. Go to Christ daily. Feed on Christ daily. More than daily. Personally feed on him by faith. Go to him in prayer. Depend on his gospel grace. Keep your joy in him burning brightly. If it's burning dimly, then attend to it. Go to the priest, like, it's, uh, like Andrew Bonar said. Go to him and have, you, have him trim your wick or whatever he needs to do and have him sort you out. Go to Christ so that your light, his light in you, by, burns brightly. Do you see that Jesus says, keep your lamps burning? Yes, Jesus keeps his own, but we need to keep ourselves Keep your lamps burning, he says. And so we need to do that internally and also outwardly. We need to live out this inner Christian life in every thought and word and deed. We need to walk by the Spirit, drawing on the Spirit like we thought, this oil that's continually feeding through these golden pipes. And so Christ supplies us with continual unending supplies of his Holy Spirit. And so we're to produce the fruit of the Spirit as we're engrafted into Christ, into the tree of life. I hope this hasn't confused you this evening, but here's the bottom line. Keep your lamp trimmed and burning. The lamp of Christ, the light of Christ in you, believer. And in in this way, as you continually do that to the end, to the end of your life, until Christ returns, you'll be ready for the day that he appears. Let's pray.